Welcome, everyone, to the third annual Logical LA Conference. So let's be clear about what this conference is about and what exactly is scientific skepticism. Briefly stated by Paul Kurtz, one of the giants of scientific skepticism, a skeptic is one who is willing to question any claim to truth, asking for clarity and definition, consistency and logic, and adequacy of evidence. The use of skepticism is thus an essential part of objective scientific inquiry and the search for reliable knowledge. Carl Sagan said, Science is a way of skeptically interrogating the universe with a fine understanding of human fallibility. If we are not able to ask skeptical questions, to interrogate those who tell us that something is true, to be skeptical of those of authority, then we're up for grabs for the next charlatan, political or religious, who comes ambling along. At the heart of this movement is the quest for truth using scientific inquiry. With so much pseudoscience, we need a methodology that can be used to tell us not if a claim is 100% true, but to examine if a claim is most likely true. In other words, to provisionally believe a claim is true until more compelling evidence is presented. Science and scientific research can and will improve our understanding of social issues as well. But there is one issue that is overriding all of these issues. It's climate change. We are placing the human race in a precarious position for future generations as we ignore the prognosis of the world as a whole. As the SGU, Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, said several weeks ago on one of their podcasts, this generation is the one who must start to change our planet. It will be much more difficult for the future generations to make a significant change without doubling or tripling the cost to make that change. And most of the current world issues will diminish because all efforts will be placed on saving our planet. We should help other carbon-intensive countries change to a carbon-neutral energy sources. We hope you enjoy the stimulating lectures that our speakers have to offer. Mark Tabbert, where are you? He's right here, very good. So he's going to talk to us about it, and uh, let's give him a round of applause. Oh, you want to do that first? Yeah. Okay, all right. Let me find it on here. I know, a lot of people did. Here it is. Okay, here we go. Climate science, global warming science, started when Lincoln was president. True or false? Yeah, blue first. Okay. What's the answer? <laughs> it's false. Then the, the first climate change model was done with three pencils and a world map. Yes or no? True or false? Blue. So... If we can do it with a pencil, three pencils and a world map, <laughs> what? Am I missing something here? Anyway, I'm sorry I put my hand up in front. So let's bring Mark up. He's going to tell us all about the pencils and the map. Thank you, sir. Thanks for being here. Thanks, sir. Thanks. I appreciate the invitation. I'm glad for the chance to do this. And I, and I do think I've got a very hopeful message. So I'm going to... I'm going to introduce myself and I'm going to ask you a question and you can hold up both flags. It's a multiple choice. Um, so I'm Mark Tabbert. I'm a member of Citizens Climate Lobby. Uh, I'm in the, we're set up by chapters. I'm in the Orange County Coast chapter. So I handle Dana Rohrabacher's old district, currently Harley Ruda's district. And, um, and my answer to this question is I'm alarmed about climate change. Yale University gives us six Americans. So all of us in this room belong to one of those six groups according to Yale's climate change communication group. Uh, there's alarmed, concerned, people on the fence considering it cautious, people that are dismissive, disengaged, and doubtful. So I'm alarmed, and I'm gonna quickly do this poll that I don't wanna take a lot of time because I should have looked at my watch. Um, I've got 30 minutes. Um, who's alarmed? 
Who's concerned? Who's on the fence? Who's, no one's, I don't think anyone here is uh, uh, disengaged on this issue. There are some people in the United States, I've met them, that have no idea what you're, they've heard of climate change, but have no idea what it's about. Um, anybody doubtful? Anybody dismissive? Okay. That was my big concern when I talked to this group because I thought with, with some of the words in the, you know, that there might be a lot of, I've been in debates with people that disagree with climate science and uh, I was making sure this wasn't one of those groups. Um, <laughs> So Citizens Climate Lobby, I'll give you a brief introduction about CCL. We're set up by chapters. Like I said, I was in Orange County. I'm the first chapter in Orange County. My friend and I started it um, in 2012. So I've been volunteering with the group for, um, since then. It'll be 12 years in October. We have 130,000 supporters today. We're set up, we now have seven chapters in Orange County, 23 in Southern California. And one of my hopes is that some of the people in this room or people you know will get involved with Citizens Climate Lobby. I've told some people here and I tell the same thing to just about everybody. If you understand what our policy is that we're supporting in Congress and you like it, you never have to come to another meeting because you could be an effective lobbyist for us with your friends, your family, your, your neighbors, your strange people you meet. Um, so. I was supposed to be able to see my notes, and I, I don't really need notes, but I've never really done my own PowerPoint before until this one. I've worked with other people using their slides, and this time I've really sort of rehearsed what I'm going to say today. We believe, Citizens Climate Lobby believes the solution to climate change is democracy. It's that simple. Um, we lobby Congress, and we, we lobby our local leadership. We lobby, we lobby uh, leaders and all, you know, religious leaders. Uh, um, political leaders locally, your mayor, your congressman, the state legislatures, the state of California years ago actually endorsed our solution to climate change, which I'll talk about today. And what's a CCLer? I believe, I believe, I, I'm representing a CCLer. I'm an optimistic, nonpartisan relationship builder, striving for integrity, working to create the political will for a stable climate and working to empower individuals to have breakthroughs and exercise in their personal and political power. Those are our only two goals. So if we talk about fracking, and we write a letter to the editor about fracking, we'll write, a, we'll write some negative stuff about fracking for sure, but we'll, we'll bring our letter back to the focus on we don't need more fossil fuel. We have too much in the ground right now. We need to stop looking for new stuff. We need to stop drilling. That would be our the message in our, in our literature. I had something else I think I was gonna say in here, but I forgot what it is. Um, so like I said, um, and I did lose my notes. I wish I had my notes right now. Um, because what I was gonna go from here, I was just gonna say, I'm alarmed about climate change, I've already said that. And I'm gonna go now to where I'm coming from on a larger scale. I learned about climate change at theology school. I had a business. I've always been a broker in my career. I was a steel broker, a scrap steel broker. I, was, I owned a firm when I started my first business. I was an executive search firm. Um, I was the high end of high tech. That was my specialty. And um, so I brokered people. Then I brokered later insurance. I was selling insurance to builders and developers who were doing track homes in the boom days of that industry. And when that declined, I became a broker of businesses. So I've always been a middleman. And today I'm a middleman with you guys. My, cust my product is the bill that we have in Congress right now, HR 763. It's called the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. And it has 57 sponsors, which I, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me go back to my, I had this business going, um, and it was doing well. I started my first business when I was 49 years old. I became an executive search firm, like I said. And I was doing well enough that I was able to tell my wife at the time, I'm either going to become a minister or I'm going to become a forest ranger. 
you know. That didn't make her very happy. I had kids in college paying bills and stuff. But I was doing well, so I, I actually went as a full-time student. And my theology is like this. I'm a Christian. I go to a, a Presbyterian church. I don't believe Jesus is God. I don't take anything in the Bible literally. But I think there's a lot of value in religion. And I'm looking forward to learning more about atheism. I learned uh, about the newsletter that's written by one of your members. Um, and I'm really interested to have that kind of conversation. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Um, the reason I mentioned this course is because I learned in 19, I learned from 1990 science that the world's in trouble. I was an environmentalist before, but I never really realized how bad things were on the planet, not only for climate change, that wasn't my big issue. I didn't understand climate change to be the risk that I do today, but I could understand overfishing. I could understand species extinction. I could understand overpopulation. So that's, and that book really, and that was 1990 science taught at a theology school in a course called Earth Ethics. My screen is flashing for some reason. I don't know what I've done. Uh, the next book I read that really brought me back again to this issue was Collapse. And I'm going to talk more about the book of Collapse in just the next slide. In the book Moral Ground, at the beginning, of, there's a guy named Gus Speth at the beginning of that book, Moral Ground, that in five pages explains how bad things are and how worse they're getting, every, how bad they're getting every day. Um, I actually ran for city council in Newport Beach. I was going to change the world on climate change. That was in 2010. Uh, I wasn't successful, uh, but I, as I learned more and more about the science, I became more and more uh, focused on one issue, climate change. These are the risks, the big risks I see in the world today. They all come from Jared Diamond's book. He's a Pulitzer Prize winning author. He's a scientist at UCLA. So the first four things, loss of biodiversity, loss of natural habitat, loss of wild food sources, loss of soil, four different ways we lose soil, population problems. The bigger problem for Americans is not population, it's resource use per person. Uh, things we're doing to the, uh, there's ceilings set now. We are, our aquifers are running out. And I keep, <laughs> photosynthetic ceiling, that means we're using all the sunlight to, pr to produce stuff for Americans, for not Americans, for human beings. And that's a big problem. The combination of these 11 things on this screen are things that Jared Diamond said have combined to make other societies collapse. The big one to me, and I think it should be to everybody, is climate change. And I can't believe what a great introduction I got this morning from, from the, the, our introductory video. I mean, that should be part of my presentation. Um, I had no idea that that was going to be here, and that was awesome. Um, forget that screen. I'll just use this one. Just real quickly, the World Economic, this is to make two points. The World Economic Forum in 1919 showed that their concern now, their top three, their top three issues, you can't read this slide, but they're all related to climate change. And in 2008, 11 years before, it didn't get mentioned at all in the top five. So in, in you know, and that's, that's sort of the theme that I'll be talking about today. We have a growing awareness of the problem thanks to people like AOC, Alexandria Ortiz, or Alexandria Cortez, or, you know, AOC. Um, we, we just absolutely love what she's done because she's raised this issue very much so. And you're going to see other examples of that coming up. So the solution I'm going to talk about today is carbon pricing. Carbon pricing is a solution to climate change. We have it in California called cap and trade. We have a carbon tax in Canada, in British Columbia. And actually the truth of the matter is nine of the largest 11 economies in the world today have a price on carbon. Nine of 11. Who are the, who are the people that don't? Take a guess. Say it loud. No, China's, China's ahead of the United States, far ahead. They've got, they've got a carbon tax in three provinces similar to ours, not as effective as California, but similar. The two, the two are Russia and the United States. 
Everybody else has a price on carbon somehow. And I just used a local scientist that we happen to talk to. And, and I make an important point in this slide. Altruistic behavior is not the way. And it never was the way. If you go back and read the history of, and I brought some props. So when, once I learned the science, I read a lot of science, right? But once you understand the science of climate change, you, I, you get tired of reading the same stuff, a different version, somebody else's story. But this book, don't even think about it, is highly recommended. Uh, I buy copies by the wholesale price, and I didn't bring a bunch to sell today, but I, I can get you a wholesale price, uh, 10 bucks, um, and I'm free delivery if you're in the area, if you're in Orange County. Um, this explains how when climate change started and became an issue back in the 80s, it became an environmental issue. And the environmental groups, with the best intention, talked about carbon footprints. There's a problem with that. If you talk about my carbon footprint and you get into my personal life, and I'm a Republican, I'm not, but if I was, and you start telling me what to do with my carbon footprint, I'm gonna turn you off as fast as I can. I don't want any tree hugger to tell me what to do. So the story of that kind of stuff is in this book. And, and you guys would like this book. I talked to um, our, the man from Austin, um, who's speaking today later. Yeah, uh, Brooke, what is it? Thomas. I'm terrible with names. I learned too many people names. Um, this, is a, this tells you psychologically and genetically, human beings are not good at long-term thinking. That's true of not just other guys. It's true of everybody. Uh, and climate change is especially problematic because climate change, we've been lied to about it for so long that that adds to our problem. And it's a complicated subject, you know? I mean, you know, you're, you're not, we're not thought to be powerful enough to change the weather. So it's an, um, I'll talk more. The next 11 slides, I'm gonna go through fairly quickly. Because since the meeting in Korea, the IPCC said something that the scientists have never said before. And one of the things that really have upset me over the years is that scientists don't talk about solutions. My best example was a guy at Chapman University. He was from Lawrence Livermore Laboratories. And he was part of a national group of educators, big, big group, real smart people. And he spoke to probably 2,500 students on a Friday afternoon. He was so, such a big audience, they had a, a video and, and there were a bunch of other students in another room. And he said to those students, he said, you guys, the most important thing in your life is not going to be where you go to school, what you major in, who you get married to. The most important thing in your life is going to be the fact that when you burn carbon, you release, you release CO2 and you warm the atmosphere. Now, I thought that was a pretty bold statement coming from a scientist. So who was the first one? I was in the, I was in the room. I was one of the older people in the place. And I, my hand went up and I said, so what's the solution? I knew what it was, but what was he going to say? And he said what scientists say, and this is so true of everybody that ever, I've ever asked that question of. That's not my specialty. That's not my field. <laughs> if you understand what the choices are in climate change solutions, there's four. There's government regulations, rules and regulations. I'm, now I'm going to blank for what the four are. There's a carbon tax, a simple carbon tax. There's cap and trade. Uh, rules and regulations I named, and I've forgotten the other one. Subsidies. Subsidies. So, thank you. That, those are the four. So what, how hard is it for scientists to decide what she's going to support? But they never did. Well, in October, in Korea, I think there were 100 or so scientists that met, and out of that meeting they said the underlying part here. The report emphasizes the potential role of tax on carbon dioxide emissions. So that's the IPCC. The next one that came out, so that was October. In, uh, I think it was December, it was January 17th. Four 
These are the guys, four chairs of the Federal Reserve, 27 Nobel laureate economists, 15 chairs of the Council of Economic Advisors, two former secretaries of U.S. Department of Treasury. These guys came out with a, a solution for climate change that they supported, and they had four things, four things in it. All four of those things are in our bill without an exception. There's no, no, there's no difference. That, that thing has been signed now, but the last count I heard was over 3,500 economists. And, if you, and, and I have a list of those economists. I don't have it, the link here. I have a link for those people. Um, I, I, I just realized I've, I've skipped a video. I knew I had a video I wanted to show, but I didn't. I forgot to do it. Um, those economists are, are people that you can look up by universities to see who supports it. So that's the IPC. Now we have countries that are coming out. This is the example of Canada, Trudeau. But if you look in the newspaper last week, you'll see that, that Germany, that's part of a carbon, uh, part of a cap and trade kind of system in Europe, they're moving over and they're now looking at a simple carbon tax. And there are other countries I could name, but those are the two that are most recent in my mind. Who's the Silicon Valley leadership group? They're a group of over 300 companies. It includes all the big companies in the internet, in the um, Silicon Valley kind of world, Microsoft, you name them, they're in this group. But companies like Coca-Cola are in this group. And they've come out in support of our bill with a question. And here's their question. And it's typical that this question would come from Californians. I've got 11 minutes left. Um, we look forward to working with the authors of H.R. 763 to specify how they will work with California and other jurisdictions with existing carbon pricing regimes to implement a coherent carbon pricing policy. So those people are concerned about all the people that worked really hard in California to pass cap and trade, uh, AB 32. Um, and that's really important to be respectful. California should be complimented so much for what Arnold Schwarzenegger, that good Republican, did on, ca on, on climate change. Um, but it's going to be a problem because right now, politicians get a million dollars or so. A billion, I'm sorry, billions of dollars. They get it from cap and trade money and they give it out to people that, you know, the Democrats want to help. So that's going to be an issue for people in California, although right now we have we have the leader of the Black Climate, in, in Congress, we have the leader of the Black Climate, climate Caucus, uh, including in, in nine other members. We have four members of the um, House uh, Ways and Means Committee. So we're getting, and Barbara Lee, the only person in Congress that voted against the Iraq invasion, she's a supporter of our bill. There's 57 supporters. So we'll deal with that one. Faith groups. The Presbyterian Church supports our, our bill. Episcopalians support carbon pricing like we do it. The Catholic bishops have endorsed our bill. The United Church of Christ, I mentioned a little bit about them because the man that started that effort is a guy named Dr. Uh, James, James Martin. He's in our, our chapter. He's sort of a quiet scientist, right? But he, he's a big believer at the UCC church. He goes there every week and he's always talking about climate change. And he started an effort to get the whole denomination to support our bill, and he did it. And he did it in about 10 weeks. Um, so that's 850,000 people, and that's uh, like 900 churches that are all UCC. Young Evangelicals for Climate Action, another group that endorses our bill. Pope Francis, I could talk a lot about him because we were in his first encyclical, our leading lobbyist is also a scientist out of Scripps, and he was in the Vatican with the Pope when he came out with his, um, it's a Catholic term, Virginia, encyclical. Hi, Virginia, thank you. Um, and there are a lot more. I just put some down quickly. AOC. At a Martin Luther Day speech, AOC insisted that the externality costs produced by industry be paid by industry. That's exactly what a carbon tax is. Right now, they dump their pollution in the air for free. If you put a price on carbon and you continually raise that price, you're going to drive fossil fuels to be less and less competitive. Later, she said, a carbon tax is conceivably a very moderate policy now. 
I guarantee you that we want her to support our bill, but we, not necessarily today. We don't want to confuse socialism and climate change because that could be a problem going for us. So I'm sure that we have a CCL person out there working with AOC, probably a little group of people. So I'll leave it at that. 70 health organizations, included the AMA and the American Lung Association, you name them, all the big ones came out for uh, putting a price on carbon to, for the true social cost. Just, this is just last, maybe a week and a half ago, a million people, representing a million people, different medical societies recommended this step, put a price on carbon that reflects its true social cost and phase out investments in and subsidies for fossil fuels. U.S. Conference of Mayors, a very important group. And if you, if you want to get involved with our group and you know your mayor or your city council people, do what Virginia Bernal, stand up, Virginia, do me a favor. Stand up real quickly. She passed a resolution, her group, her chapter. She's one of my best trainees. Um, she passed a resolution in Santa Ana endorsing our bill. And that's huge because you see Luke Correa yet, who's her congressman, hasn't yet co-sponsored our bill. That puts pressure on him. Uh, I'm gonna go back. Can I go back? No, I won't go back. I, yeah, well, um, City of Santa Ana, I just mentioned, the LA Board of Supervisors endorsed our bill. This is two weeks ago. The United Church of Christ, I mentioned the story there. Presidential candidates. I'm down to six minutes. <laughs> so I'm gonna, the two people, the two people that you really should understand that are really speaking the word is Mayor Pete, who I love, and John Delaney. Um, but all these people, if I had time, I could read through the, just a line about each one of them. I'd be happy to do that with you. Pete, are you in the back? Pete Anderson? Pete Anderson, look in the back where Pete's waving. Pete, Pete is by my little table where I've got my literature set up. And I'll be, ask, I'll be showing you what I've got and ask you to go back and, and talk to us. Pete's not a CCLer per se, but he's been to our meetings. He's, but he's involved with this group a lot. So I've been talking about our solution without talking about the bill specifically, and I've got to run through these fairly quickly. That's the name of the bill, HR, House Resolution, House Resolution 763. It took us 12 years to get that in. We're a $5 million, a $5 million nonprofit. And why did we get a bill in and some of the big, you know, the Friends of the Earth, the Sierra Club, the, uh, the National Defense Council. Why haven't they? Partly because, partly because we're just focused on one thing. And, we, and this is what I forgot to say in that first slide. We, we base everything we do on relationships. My, my job today is to sell you this policy so that you help me. I'm, I'm selling my product, this bill, so that you go to this website. This is the website for the bill. We built it, but it's, it's the bill's website. And on this website, you can endorse. If you look at the top, you can do these different things. And you can learn about the bill. These were our first sponsors. Today, I told you we have 57. We need 200. The Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, the EPA, they all passed by, by majorities in the, in the House of 400 to 35, not exactly, but about those kind of majorities. We need that today if we're going to get it done while Trump's in office. And is that impossible? Not in my imagination. I, uh, I think it's going to be like same-sex uh, same marriage. It's going to go from impossible one day to a done deal the next. And the more you believe it, the more you help it come true. That's something I believe. Um, I don't know where I read that. That's not in this speech, but I, I, I believe that. If you believe something and you act and you, and you believe it, your, your actions change because of that. So this bill, effective, good for people, good for the economy, so it's good for business. It's bipartisan, it's revenue neutral, and there's one missing, it's global. I'm gonna go through each one of these. Effective, and I don't have my notes, but I can do it from my head. In the first 10 years, 
I'm sorry, effective, I know perfectly. 40% reduction in emissions on this, uh, under this bill, 40% under 12 years, 90% reduced inductions by 2050 on this bill. There's nothing else in the world, that, there's nothing else on the table anywhere that's, this is three times more powerful than Paris because it's global, three times more powerful than Paris, and not just for our country that I'm using that three times number, but for all countries they are gonna be forced to really do what Paris wanted to do. Um, that was, there was more. Um, oh, <laughs> I've never had this feature ever. 40% in 12 years, supported by economists, scientists, simple comprehensive. I changed that slide, but it didn't get changed here. Good for people. The reason it's a progressive tax is not because, oh gosh, two minutes and a half. The reason it's good for, for people is this. Um, you, if you're poor, if you're middle class, you don't burn carbon. You may think you do because you've been led to believe that your carbon footprint's so important, but it's not. We burn carbon every time we spend a dollar. So whoever spends lots of dollars burns a lot of carbon. They don't realize it because they think their car is carbon. Your lights, your heating and air conditioning, and your gasoline in your car is only 36% of the American carbon footprint, 36%. The other 64% is hidden in stuff we buy. That tablecloth has carbon. This floor has carbon. The building has carbon. His shirt has carbon. This has carbon. Everything's got carbon. So it's progressive because the bottom two-thirds of this tax, the bottom two-thirds of people, make money on the deal because they're getting a dividend every month. I'll explain how this bill works if I get time. It's progressive. Health costs fall. Lives are saved. Yes, that's there. The number of jobs increases by 1.9 million jobs in 10 years, almost 3 million jobs in 20 years. It's good for business because actually GNP goes up, which is a problem for me based on what I know, that we really got to change our definition of growth. But if you're selling this thing to, to Republicans, which I have to, we have to get both parties, they like hearing that the economy is going to get stronger and GNP is going to go up. Here's, here are the numbers. I didn't know this thing worked this way. When this bill was introduced, it had four Republicans and six Democrats. That was the last Congress. It was called the bookmark. Today, there's only one Republican, but that's good news because Republicans today understand climate change is something they're gonna to have to deal with. Why is that good? This change is good news. History will judge harshly my colleagues who deny the climate science or climate change. You know who said that? Do you know who said that? Do you know who Matt Gates is? He's a Republican, and he's an a-hole, I'm quoting. <laughs> According to his Republican friends, he's not somebody people like, but he said a wonderful thing, and I tweet him all the time, and anything I can compliment him on, I do, and I try to keep complimenting him on the fact that he's got a green real deal. I don't have time to explain it, but it's good. Luntz. Republicans today are under 40, and my time is out. What do I do about this? I, what's that? So I didn't talk about how our bill works, and I was sort of planning on leaving that out. That used to be the first thing I did, now it's the last. Because I'm trying to show that carbon pricing is the answer. And if you don't understand what it is, learn about it and tell people.